It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week, we were in the vast chaos and swirling depth of everything that the Creator moves and builds out of. The creation of time itself, of, of the days, wrapping up with creation and rest. Genesis then goes from the vastness down to a very tight, focused story. Two people, a tree, a serpent. That's about it. Right? There continues to be many questions to ask as we read this, something so tightly written that every word really does matter, and the words that aren't there matter just as much. We begin this second story of creation that Genesis tells, and we could begin by asking, questioning it and pointing out, like, it says that uh, it's in Genesis 2.5. This would be a good Sunday to follow along in your Bible if you have one handy. But uh, it says in Genesis 2.5 that uh, there weren't any bu bushes on the earth because there was no one there to water them, whereas back in Genesis 1.11 that uh, the bushes were created on the third day and there was definitively no one to water them until the sixth day. Right? You, we could try to resolve all potential conflicts, but I think that misses the point. The first story is at a big, vast cosmic level, and this is something far closer and tighter, and uh, we seem to be okay with four Gospels that sometimes disagree with each other. I think we can do okay with two accounts of creation that sometimes don't match detail for detail. So we're going to try a speculative reading of Genesis this week. When I say speculative, I, I mean that I'm going to wander afield, and, and at the end of this you might, or you might not, agree with me. I would not be surprised either way. Isn't that a great way to start a sermon? <laughs> you never know what's coming next, right? We'll see where we, we land. This story is, faced, is focused on what is a human, right? That, the very beginning, what is a human? A human is a combination of breath and dirt. Breath, the breath of God, with it comes the ability to perceive infinity, to imagine majesty, to create music and architecture, and, and I mean, just the, the beauty and the vastness and the capability is all wrapped up in the breath of God, and it is then breathed into dirt. Right? I'm, a, I'm reminded of that line from a Aladdin, uh, the movie Aladdin, when the genie is talking about phenomenal cosmic powers, itty bitty living space. Right? That, that's, that feels like a fairly accurate description of the human existence. We, we might be sitting on the couch and be absorbed in the most sublime reading or piece of poetry or thought, and then you get up and your knee doesn't quite bend right. And it's, oh, yep, still in a body. That uh, seems to be accurate to how we exist. Right, so then it moves on and describes the four rivers. All, all of early civilization is revolved around rivers, because you've got to have something to drink. And, and so to say that uh, God creates the, the rivers, that, 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 that is everything that humanity knows is along the rivers. And then we read that God, having created the world and God created Eden, puts humanity, puts Adam in the garden. And what is the first task that humanity is given? Right? The first thing they're told to do is to work. Right? At the very beginning, you are meant to work, to keep and to till the garden. Working is part of the intention. This is the point that... Uh, why would someone text me on a Sunday morning? I apologize. Uh, this is the point at which... God realizes that it is not good that Adam is alone, but God doesn't do anything about it yet, does God? All right. Adam goes out and, and experiences all the Adams, all the animals, and names them and gets involved with them, and then Adam realizes, ah, I'm lonely. It is only when Adam realizes what God already knows that something happens. Right? God, from the beginning, God is not forcing anything on anyone. So now they both know, lonely. So Adam is put to sleep. And, and then this is where, the, 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 up till now, the only noun that's been used for humanity is Adam. And in Hebrew, the word for earth is Adamah. And out of Adama, the earth, is made Adam, or as we pronounce it, Adam. 
And so Adama is split, the, uh, put to side and split. And, and the, we translate it as rib. You know, we have a lot of words for, we have very precise words for all the parts of our body. In Hebrew, everything from here to there is your foot, right? One word. We have like upper leg, thigh, inner thigh, knee. I mean, we have all the p names for ever, all the toes, right? Hebrew, one word, foot, right? And, and so when it talks about how uh, Adam is split, it's not his rib, it's side, right? So humanity, Adam, this collective noun, is put to sleep and split one side and then the other side, right? And, and so there is, and after the split happens, that's when the words for male and female are used for the first time, ish and isha. Before this, the term male and female has never been used. After the split, it's male and female. And, and now that there is humanity split into two sides, male and female, we can see that they're both made in the image of God, equal and different. And... Um, Part of the way that this image of God is understood, in the Jewish tradition, I find it fascinating that they don't talk about the image of God when a child is born. They talk about the image of God when a, a male and a female come together as hus husband and wife as one. Right? That's where the image of God is seen, when you bring back together the two sides. That, that's the image of God there in the, in the Jewish under practice, the Jewish understanding. And so then we have Adam wakes up and sees Eve, and we have the first love song. You might want to take note of this. This is the first love song ever sung. Adam looks over and says, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It was probably a bit more romantic in the Hebrew, but if you want to wake up and, and, and sing that to your uh, significant other coming up here on Valentine's Day, I've... I may do it to Olivia because she's not here to hear that and uh, just see what happens. <laughs> so, uh, first love song. And then they have a snack together because we noticed that Adam and Eve were together on this. They have this snack. And it's interesting, again, taking note of this, the word choice and, and what they say and what they don't say. Eve is asked, would you like to try that fruit over there? And what does she say? She says, God has told us not to eat it or to touch it. What, if you go back a few verses, what had God exactly said? Don't eat. Don't eat of that tree. Keep the garden, till the garden, take care of everything. That's your work, but don't eat of that tree. And now what we hear is Eve saying, don't eat and don't touch. It's kind of hard to care for a tree that you can't touch. What's going on here? You ever get told that you can't do something and then it becomes sort of taboo and you get fascinated by it, right? Andy, don't touch the oven. Ooh, what's in the oven, right? That may have happened when I was far shorter. Now, Andy, don't touch the oven. Mmm, oven, right? So you, you get told not to do something and then you're fascinated by it. And that's the thing, that's what's happening. Don't, don't eat, don't touch, right? And, and Adam and Eve, they, they go ahead and they eat. They have a piece of fruit. We don't know what it is. The word for fruit there, it, it's just the word for fruit. It's not the word for apple. It could have been the kumquat. It could have been a, a star fruit. It could have been a pear for all we know. But uh, well, that, that they have this, this piece of fruit and they share it. And they're both there. They both eat it together. This is not... Have you ever heard someone argue that Adam ate out of pity for Eve? I've heard some people argue that before, that, that Adam, because he was such a wonderful guy and men are supposed to protect women, that they, he ate just so that she wouldn't be alone, right? That's hooey. It's not in the text. Sorry. Uh, they both are made in the image of God. They both decide to eat. God calls them because God knows there's a problem, goes with being God. And... Uh, we see what happens, right? The first way that humanity falls is in deception. 
right? The deception of, of, oh, I can eat the apple. That won't be a problem. It's kind of like driving down the road. You deceive yourself. You think, I'm in a hurry. I can speed. There won't be a cop over that hill. We're in Sullivan County. There's always a cop over that hill. But we deceive ourselves and think, oh, I can, it's okay, right? So the first failure is deception. The second failure is what we see right here when uh, hum in humanity when God says what happened. A and what does Adam say? She made me do it. And what does Eve say? Snake made me do it, right? And so this is the second failure. Blame, right? It's amazing how they go from innocent and pure to understanding, A, there is such a thing as responsibility, and I'm not the one, right? I'm sorry. You notice you get pulled over. Everyone gets very polite. Yes, officer? Yes, sir. Do you realize? Yes, sir. I my, my wife made me do it. Eek! Right? <laughs> How well does that ever go? Can you give her a ticket? <laughs> yeah, right. So the first two failings of humanity, deception and blame. And so what happens? This is, this is commonly called the curse. But if you look at what it actually says, it's in verses uh, 3.14 and 3.17. What is cursed? What exactly is cursed here? It's the snake and it's the ground. Humanity is not cursed. What happens is the snake in the ground, the creation and, 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 and the land, bear the consequences of what humanity does. True back then, still true today. So this is not the curse of humanity. What has happened here, so what's the word for what has happened here that you expect to have been used by now? What's the, what is this? This is the first three letters, starts with S, ends with N, usually has an I in the middle. Right? Yeah. Have you read the word sin yet? You can go ahead and check. It's not there. Sin doesn't show up till the next chapter when Cain and Abel have a little bit of a falling out, right? This is not sin. The Bible doesn't say it's sin. And the Bible is very forward about saying when something's a sin. I mean, you have the entire block of writings called the prophets who show up and say, sin, right? It doesn't say that this is sin. So what happened? Humanity has gained knowledge of good and evil, and humanity now knows something. And, and there is knowledge like intellectual data, like I know the way that bones are put together and how they grow in epiphyseal plates and osteoclasts and osteoblasts and calcium deposits. Like I, I know about bones. Who here has broken a bone? No one, okay, you know something about bones that I do not know. I've never broken a bone. And when you break a bone, there's got to, there's a, 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 you know something. Like you look down and your arm is bending in a way that it's never bent before. And you now know something, don't you? Kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies to think about it, right? I think that's the difference here. There's now knowing is like intellectual understanding, and there's knowing is actually knowing what it feels like for one piece of your bone to rub across another when it shouldn't, and you go, ah, makes me kind of queasy thinking about it. I don't think there's anything magical about the fruit that Adam and Eve share. I don't think it's not like they, they started eating through and when they got to the core of it that there was some sort of magical hard drive that uploaded all of the data they needed to know about good and evil. I don't think this was data intake. I think this is more like knowing what it's like to break a bone. This is not knowledge in the abstract. This is knowing what it means and what it feels like to be told you shouldn't do that and doing it anyways. Andy, don't touch the stove. Psst, right? What happened there? What do I, what do you know when you touch the stove? Yeah. Do I, is it is anything in my brain? Is there anything intellectual that I now comprehend? My mom had already told me it's hot. It's not like now I know it's hot. And it's, I've experienced it, right? I've experienced it. I have done it, right? You get into, you do something and there are consequences, right? I, I don't think that there's anything magical about the fruit. I think it very well could have been, God could have just as easily said, don't drink out of the pond of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the water. It's not the fruit. It's someone says, don't do this. And you did it anyways. 
Right? This is like raising children in that moment where they look, you say don't, and they look up at you, and they reach out, and they touch it. And there are consequences, because you told them not to, and you told them not to for a reason. Right? This is part of growing up. The consequences, you do something and you have a consequence. You break your arm, your arm is going to be in a cast. The same thing is happening here. There are consequences. Humanity, Adam and Eve, had made a decision. They are not going to do what they are told. And so now they are also going to have some consequences. God has tried to raise them like children, and God has gone through the heartbreak of raising children, and now they are going to go through the heartbreak of raising children. Uh, Eve is told, you will have children, and it's going to hurt. And I don't think it's just talking about actually having the child. I think it's talking about the heartbreak of raising the child, because a child will tear your heart out. Won't, won't that child, right? That's part of being a parent. You, and Eve is further told, you're going to have relationships, and they're going to get messed up. Your desire will be for a husband. You are meant to be in a relationship, and it's going to go sideways, and it's going to be bad, because you will make decisions, and when you make bad decisions, you will pay the consequences. The, Adam is told, you will toil at work, and now you're going to realize that it's hard. Right? You're going to realize that this is hard. That's the consequence. You are going to become aware uh, of pain. And you will return to the dust from which you were made. Right? They were going to die anyways, but now they have a sense uh, of where they're headed and that they may, may or may not get there. There's a time frame on their lives. And, and it ends, this passage ends with them leaving Eden. And the question I would leave us with today, I want to take one more minute to explore, is was paradise lost or did they outgrow it? Did they lose paradise or did they outgrow it? Rabbi Harold Kushner uh, wrote a book about this, How Good Do We Have to Be? He's the same guy who wrote uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And he writes the alternative ending to the story. This is how Genesis, maybe this is the other way it could have ended. So the woman saw that the tree was good to eat and delight to the eye, and the serpent said to her, Eat of it, and when you eat of it, you will be as wise as God. But the woman said, No, God has commanded us not to eat of it, and I will obey God. And God called to man and woman and said to them, Because you have hearkened to my word and not disobeyed my command, I shall reward you greatly. To the man he said, You will never have to work again. Spend all your days in idle contentment with food growing all around you. To the woman he said, You will bear children without pain and you will raise them without pain. They will need nothing from you. Children will not cry when their parents die and parents will not cry when their children die. To both of them, he said, for the rest of your lives, you will have full bellies and contented smiles. You'll never cry. You'll never laugh. You will never long for something you don't have, and you will never re receive something you always wanted. And the man and the woman grew old together in the garden, eating daily from the tree of life and having many children. And the grass grew high around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil until it disappeared from view, for there was no one to tend it. Isn't that an interesting alternative take? Right? Is this paradise lost, or is it paradise outgrown? I don't read Genesis and read it as Adam and Eve making one mistake and being booted from paradise now never to let back in. I don't think of this as a story of humanity being forever punished for one mistake. I don't think that the statement that if you eat from this tree, you'll know of good and evil and you'll die, I don't think that's a rule. I think that's just the warning. You touch the stove, it's going to burn. And now you know what it means to touch the stove. Now you know what it, the consequences are. And the consequences of this action are they work and they know it's hard. They will be parents and they'll understand how a child can rip out their heart along the way. They will have relationships, and some of them are going to go bad, and they're going to have a sense of mortality and know that they will one day die. This seems to sum up the human experience, right? Work, family, relationships, and an awareness of death. We entered the world we know today when Adam and Eve have a snack. Was it the fall? Was it a disgrace? What would be the best way to describe it? I think the best word I can describe it when Adam and Eve leave is kind of like a lurch. You kind of... Right? You're moving forward. It's a fall for you're moving forward, but it's not exactly graceful, is it? Right? You, it's not paradise lost, it's paradise outgrown, as they stumble out of it with the same awkwardness of teens who have not yet grown into their feet. 
are going into their bodies. We entered the world today, and we're headed somewhere. Right? When it comes to the end of Revelation, what does it describe as where we're headed? Does it say we're going back to Eden? No. We're going to the city of God. That's where we're headed. Like the kingdom of God and the city of God c comes down. We're not going back to Eden. We've outgrown it. We're following in the footsteps of Jesus, learning to go from lurching to walking to striding, hopefully one day to running, following Jesus in his footsteps towards something greater than where we began. Right? Garden of Eden is not paradise lost. It's paradise outgrown. I told you it was going to be speculative. Does that make sense? Questions? Yeah. Chew on that. I can't wait to see what you think about it. <laughs> and if you want to read the, stay, the book, uh, Harold Kushner, Rabbi Harold Kushner.